Um, good afternoon. Hopefully you can all hear me. Uh, my name's Nick and I'm head of our J6 um, group in Chambers. And for those who don't know, um, J6 is six years called and below um, in Chambers group. And what we've been doing for the past year and a half have been putting on lectures um, targeted, I suppose, towards um, topics that may affect junior barristers and also um, junior solicitors. Um, this is now perhaps like the 10th or 12th in our series. Um, just before we begin, I suppose on a, on a very sad note, um, I think I just wanted to say um, that as many of you may have been aware, our much loved colleague and dear friend Georgia Lassoff passed away um, a few weeks ago. Um, she was an avid member of, the, of this group and had actually given um, numerous lectures um, on a range of topics um, she was kind she was hilarious and above all well, not above all but she was a bloody good barrister and I think she was someone who really believed in a multitude of good causes and effectively um, fought the good fight um, our thoughts and condolences go to her close family and friends at this time um, I'm not sure if people are aware, but there is a memorial book that can be signed uh, in person or uh, via email. That will be translated into the book um, as we await the memorial service for Georgia. What I'll do is put the link um, to the Redline website into the chat so that um, people can read a bit more and understand how they um, can contribute if they want to. But putting that aside, I suppose, um, welcome again to the lecture. Um, today we have two lectures. The first is done by Tim Kiley, and that's on contempt in a post-pandemic world. And the second lecture is done by Zoe Chapman, and that's entitled On the Road Again, Protest, Willful Obstruction of Highways and Lawful Excuse. Normally, um, we would have these lectures in person and the idea behind them is that they would be informal and interactive. Um, so we are keen for those here live um, to put any sort of questions that they have into the chat box and they can be answered at the end of each talk or at the end um, of, of the presentations as a whole. Um, they should be approximately 20 minutes in total and ideally this will all be done within the R. Um, there's probably a lot of detail on the slides. They're being uploaded um, along with a recording of this presentation. Um, so that is available from the Red Lion website. Um, our next talk will be on the 25th of November. Now that's going to be done virtually because our chambers is currently being um, refurbed. And the presenters at that talk will be Amy Reese and Faye Rolfe. So watch this space for the 25th of November. Um, but more impor importantly, perhaps, what we're planning to do is to have a social um, for J6 members and J6 solicitors um, and um, legal practitioners in October. Now that will be in person. Hopefully we'll have a tab behind the bar and the more the merrier. Um, is what I'll say to that. Um, An email will go um, out about that quite soon um, and we would really try and encourage um, as many people as possible to attend. I know it's been a while because of the pandemic but it would be great to see people in person. Um, that is everything from me. Um, any sort of queries you can email me um, or you can get in touch with the speakers directly if it's substantive in relation to their slides. Um, but without further ado, then, I will uh, introduce Tim Kiley to talk about content in a post-pandemic world. And again, thank you for attending. Thank you very much, Nick, and uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, just bear with me one moment while I share my screen so that you can all have the benefit of the PowerPoint presentation uh, that I have put together for this evening. Um, we're going to be talking, as Nick said, about uh, contempt uh, and how the law of contempt has uh, developed, really both uh, before and during the pandemic. It's something that um, 
interacts in various ways with what we do as criminal practitioners. And it's something that bumps up uncomfortably for some of us, I think, against civil practitioner um, issues at various stages. Um, the law of contempt is one that has been noted for a while uh, by legal practitioners uh, across the streams as something that often presents potential for confusion. Uh, oftentimes, uh, for civil practitioners, it's the thing that you need to dig out part 81 of the white book for uh, in order to see what, you're, uh, what you need to apply and uh, what procedures need to be run. Uh, but what I want to do over the course of the next 20 minutes or so is talk, first of all, about uh, one case in particular, a very high profile case that brought a number of these issues to a head uh, before the pandemic, uh, and then how during the pandemic and with the application of the Coronavirus Act and its provisions, uh, a number of these discussions were brought to boil uh, and some existing tensions were exposed. And what might happen after the fact uh, is... Uh, what concerns us also this evening. I'm going to begin by just quoting briefly from uh, the 14th program consultation of the Law Commission, uh, which takes account of some of the developments that I'll be talking about. And it was published in uh, early of 20, uh, early 2021, um, where it had become apparent uh, that some of the elements of contempt as it's been traditionally regarded were presenting difficulties uh, for practitioners and judges and occasionally for members of the public trying to navigate it. You can see there that they noted that previous reviews had explored specific elements of modern day contempt, but recent high profile cases, which are cited within the uh, within the article itself, and which we'll come on to in a minute, have raised the need for a the potential need for a holistic review. Uh, considering whether or not there needs to be a full codification of the law of contempt and how best to address some of the inconsistencies that it currently has, uh, whether or not there should continue to be a distinction between civil and criminal contempt uh, for the purposes of practice. Uh, and indeed, there were some proposals that that distinction should simply be abolished altogether for the purposes of dealing with contempt. And whether or not contempt itself as a concept really carries the right overtones of the kind of wrongs uh, that we seek to address. Uh, so I think it bears mentioning, first of all, just before we go any further, what exactly we even mean when we talk about contempt. I know to a lot of people in this room, it will probably seem fairly obvious. We know the kind of thing that contempt of court involves. It can be anything from failing to abide by an order imposed by the court all the way up to disruptive behavior in court, uh, shouting at the judge or otherwise creating difficulties uh, in a way that um, undermines the integrity of proceedings, but which also threatens the um, impartial and fair administration of the case. And it's that latter dimension that it sometimes felt gets lost uh, in some of the language that we use about contempt. I'm going to quote very briefly from the judgment of uh, Morris against the Crown Office. It's a fairly old judgment, but uh, Lord Justice Salmon nevertheless uh, sums up one potential difficulty of discussing these matters using a term like contempt. You can see there that it's an archaic description because this is something that has come out uh, of ancient powers of the courts uh, to regulate proceedings inside a courtroom. And it can be misleading, he says, therefore, to use a term like contempt because, quote, it suggests that contempt as a an area of law is designed to buttress the dignity of the judges and protect them from insult, when in fact, as he says, and I've outlined it there, the sole purpose of proceedings for contempt is to give our courts the power effectively to protect the rights of the public by ensuring that the administration of justice shall not be obstructed or prevented. And some of the difficulties complained of uh, both on the side of practitioners and on the side of the public include confusion about what procedures are supposed to apply uh, in uh, administering proceedings for contempt, uh, how those proceedings are to be administered, uh, what protocols need to be observed when, uh, when enforcing contempt, uh, and also what kind of conduct is caught by contempt and what sort of wrongs it seeks to address. To put some more kind of specificity on this, I want to address uh, a fairly uh, high profile case uh, 
that came to the attention of the public over the course of uh, the last two years or so uh, of Attorney General against Yaxley Lennon concerning the far-right political actor and agitator Stephen Yaxley Lennon, known to some as Tommy Robinson, uh, the founder of the far-right English Defence League. Some of you might already have picked up on uh, some of the broad substance of this if you were following news coverage of it at the time, but basically Yaxley Lennon uh, was arrested in May of 2018 while uh, performing an activity that he referred to as reporting, uh, but in any event, live streaming outside Leeds Crown Court, capturing uh, or hoping to capture various defendants as they were entering court, who at the time were on trial uh, across a series of child sexual exploitation cases. The relevant case for our purposes was Crown against ACTAR. Um, this involved not only marching up and down outside the court, uh, live streaming himself to a Facebook group, which at the time was followed by over a million people, uh, but also uh, walking up to and accosting various of the defendants or people who he thought might be the defendants on their way inside, approaching them in a fairly intimidating fashion, saying to them things like, have you brought your prison bag with you? Uh, and in one case, actively inciting an aggressive response from one of the defendants, uh, and then insinuating to his audience that that might be indicative of his guilt, uh, saying that that aggression might indicate that actually he had something to hide and he wasn't responding in the way that an innocent person might. Uh, Yaxley Lennon incidentally disputed that he was attempting to sway the trial in any way or to undermine its integrity uh, and that he was simply on rep reporting on matters that were in the public domain, though he did also take care to note that of the defendants, and I quote, 30% of them are called Muhammad. He clearly thought that this was a significant piece of information. Make of that what you will. But in any event, he was uh, arrested on the same day and pretty swiftly brought in front of the trial judges on a Judge Marston and committed to prison for contempt. This matter then went to the Court of Appeal in August of the same year. It began as effectively an appeal against sentence uh, where um, Robin, uh, Yaxley Lennon's counsel sought to... Um, challenge the length of his committal to prison, but it then became, it doesn't quite make sense to talk about a, an appeal against conviction because it wasn't a conviction for committal, but nevertheless, a conviction for contempt, it was a committal. But nevertheless, the actual procedures by which his contempt hearing had been administered then came under scrutiny. Uh, and the Court of Appeal uh, quashed the original committal order uh, on the grounds that, first of all, it had been inappropriate to deal with this matter summarily uh, in front of the trial judge, uh, who had also imposed the committal order, uh, not in the least because it became apparent as matters went on that although it had originally been taken for granted that Yaxley Lennon agreed with the facts as they had been put by the judge, who was effectively also acting as the prosecutor in this case, there were in fact substantial differences in the accounts presented by Yaxley Lennon and his counsel and the accounts as they were uh, initially presented by the, the prosecution side effectively in that case. Uh, it was tolerably clear, the Court of Appeal said, what the nub of the allegation was. It was a breach of a reporting restriction order that had been made by the judge, but it had also not been clear uh, what particular conduct of Yaxley Lennon's amounted to either a breach of that restriction or to contempt of court. Um, the substance of his conduct was never really particularized in any thorough way. And all in all, the Court of Appeal noted that the haste with which that process was conducted had curtailed his ability, actually Lennon's ability, to put forward full mitigation on his behalf uh, with the assistance of his counsel and uh, had generally meant that the um, committal was unsafe. It was recognized that this case needed to be presented by somebody other than the judge. Uh, that resulted in the matter being remitted to be heard at the Central Criminal Court, uh, before which Yax Lennon was himself released on bail and thereby freed to embark upon an interview circuit of various political programs, both in the United Kingdom and abroad, uh, where he was able to take advantage of that platform to present himself as effectively a martyr to free speech and the enforced political correctness of the judicial system. All of which I think we can agree was an undesirable outcome from the point of view of preserving the dignity and integrity of the justice system. Now, the Axley Lennon example, you might think, 
is a somewhat extreme one, but nevertheless, it did neatly crystallize a lot of the tensions and potential for confusion that had been um, inherent uh, in the law of contempt, according to some practitioners and judges for some time. Uh, not only the procedural hastiness with which the trial judge had embarked upon uh, the contempt proceedings and the lack of particularity uh, regarding Yaxley Lennon's conduct that was said to amount to contempt, uh, but also put bluntly, uh, it seemed to crystallize for a number of observers in the public that uh, the rules around reporting on court proceedings and how that interacts with contempt can sometimes seem arbitrary and weird to people who aren't involved in this kind of thing day in and day out, even when it seems perfectly obvious to legal practitioners. On the one hand, the courts are supposed to be open to the public, and that serves an important purpose both in permitting free expression and ensuring that justice is seen to be done. But on the other hand, notwithstanding that there are sometimes reporting restriction orders in place, it's also of itself a criminal offence to record sound and images inside a courtroom unless it's in the Supreme Court under Section 47 of the Constitutional Reform Act, and ordinary members of the public can be excluded from seeing certain proceedings or even having access to certain information in the interest of protecting fair and impartial judicial process. This does not always seem to reach the public uh, in a way that, uh, that, that is satisfactory, that leads to everybody being uh, completely on board with what kind of conduct is okay in and around the courts and what is not, and what are the reasons for it. So all of these tensions in the law of contempt were um, already in a fairly, you know, had already crystallized in a fairly high profile way even before the pandemic. Enter then the Coronavirus Act 2020 uh, and uh, how this uh, changed uh, or accelerated, I should say, a number of changes that were already entrained uh, in how legal proceedings were conducted. Under Section 85A of the Coronavirus Act, the court does have certain powers in cases that were wholly remotely conducted, and we've all become familiar with the increasing traffic uh, in the court system that is dealt with remotely. Uh, the court had certain powers to direct that proceedings are to be broadcast, quote, in the manner specified in the direction for the purposes of enabling members of the public to see and hear proceedings. Uh, and Section 85B of the same Act goes on to make it a criminal offence to make or attempt to make an unauthorised recording of transmissions in such proceedings. Now, on paper, that seems to make things perfectly clear. Uh, and we all know that the court's authorization is required before any proceedings of this kind are to be recorded. And we all get the warning at the beginning of every remote proceeding that we've ever participated in. You must not make a recording of any part of this hearing. It is a criminal offense to do so. We all hear the clerk say it uh, at the beginning of all remote proceedings. And so we can take it for granted, I think, that this is just accepted uh, and is, some, is, uh, is, is something that people take without question. Um, I'm going to take a break from talking about the cases just for a moment to note that uh, this first came to my attention, or that you know, many members of the public might not be as au fait with this as I first thought, when a uh, an acquaintance of mine who, for the sake of privacy, I'm going to call Bill, uh, approached me uh, regarding a case that he was involved in at that point, knowing that we had some interests in common around uh, campaigning on green issues and so on. Uh, and um, in the course of which, uh, in corresponding with me, Bill ultimately offered to send me the link, apropos of nothing, I should say, this was unprompted, uh, but offered to send me the link to his court hearing, as well as copying me into the WhatsApp chat of, of, of his counsel for the purposes of instructing him. Now, quite apart from how annoying it would have been, I'm sure, for his counsel to be receiving instructions from somebody who is not his client, uh, I know that I, I would be extremely irritated if I were in that counsel's position. I did attempt to impress as robustly as I could upon Bill that he really shouldn't give me that link. And in the course of corresponding with him, he seemed confused by this, saying, well, surely the courts are open to the public. Why would they... Uh, bar somebody from sitting in on it. Surely this is just the equivalent of sitting in the public gallery watching proceedings as they unfold. And in the course of trying to explain how this worked to Bill and look for some recent cases that might put him right on this, I came across this. 
uh, Gubarev against Orbis Business Intelligence, which was a case that did actually uh, come up during the pandemic and interacts directly with these issues. And it concerns an ongoing libel trial, I should say, it was ongoing at the time that these contempt proceedings took place. Uh, but uh, in any event, uh, what uh, caused the contempt issue to arise in this case was uh, that uh, solicitors advised clients for one of the parties in this case who had a number of interested parties uh, at various locations around the world who wanted to be in on these proceedings and see what was going on. Uh, basically, these international clients, it was said, could not reasonably be expected to wait for the official transcript to be produced by the ICLR. Uh, they wanted to uh, have access to transcriptions that were made on the day because it might affect their business interests, it might affect insurance matters and various other things. And so in order to do this, it was suggested that live transcription software uh, ought to be used uh, and uh, that that could then be supplied back to these people. Now, it was for the purposes of having members of the public uh, observe and sit in on this case. Uh, the tr the judge uh, who was sitting at the Royal Courts of Justice at the time did designate a particular courtroom, courtroom two, uh, where members of the public uh, were uh, able to sit in on and watch the proceedings if they wished. Uh, but that did not extend to uh, live transcriptions of what was going on being sent around the world to a number of other foreign actors without the court's permission. Indeed, it was set out explicitly at the start of proceedings that the court's permission would be required in order to pass on uh, any such uh, access to the proceedings uh, electronically. Unfortunately, in the course of proceedings, that was not honoured, uh, and uh, the live transcription was sent out unauthorised to a number of other foreign locations. And it, you can see from the excerpt from the judgment that's quoted there uh, by the um, uh, president of the Queen's Bench Division, uh, uh, who sat in on this, uh, that this was a deeply worrying development uh, because it crystallized exactly the danger that was posed to the ordinary administration of proceedings by having them conducted remotely and over live streaming. You can see, quote, once live streaming or any other form of live transmission takes place, the court's ability to maintain control is substantially diminished. They can't just see at a glance anymore who is uh, taking part in these proceedings in a way that might be disruptive or that might result in them live tweeting out something that they weren't supposed to. Uh, and that diminishes their ability to oversee impartial uh, justice and to make sure that the court's integrity is protected. Meanwhile, uh, in a parallel case, I'm conscious that we're... You know, I've got my eyes on the stopwatch, so I might have to move a little bit faster through this last one. But um, this uh, concerns a case involving a judicial review against Surrey County Council brought by Ms. Finch, uh, who uh, was uh, judicially reviewing a decision of the council uh, over their environmental impact assessment, how that had been conducted on a proposed fracking site at Horse Hill in Surrey. It was a case that attracted a large amount of publicity and ultimately, uh, unsurprisingly, the BBC wished to cover it because this was a matter of some considerable local interest. The High Court then authorised certain members of the press and the public to observe proceedings using a link to Microsoft Teams, although again, that was a link uh, granted only to certain authorized people, and it was a link to observe, not to record. Now, unfortunately, one of the reporters who was then given the link and who preferred to work by themselves as a sole reporter, then got deployed to film interviews and footage at the Horse Hill site while the proceedings that they wanted to report on were happening. And so because they couldn't be in two places at once, they asked a number of personnel back at the station who were not authorized to have the link to record it for her. Now, that needn't necessarily have led to anything because again, we know that warning is given at the start of proceedings. You must not make any unauthorized recordings. Unfortunately, one person didn't get that warning, who was Mrs. Finch. Uh, the link that she had originally been given wasn't working, so she got in touch, running late to the proceedings with her solicitor to say, could you please send me another link? The solicitor sent them the link. And in the meantime, she was also contacted by the reporters from the BBC, who were also not authorised, saying, hey, our link is not working, 
would you mind sending us yours? And she, thinking nothing of it, it's the BBC, surely they must know what they're doing, sent them her link. And then through a chain of events whereby a number of very senior journalists who should frankly have known better uh, seem to just wave this through because everybody assumed that everybody else had the relevant authorizations. There was a system-wide failure of the necessary safeguards, and then before you know it, uh, proceedings from inside the courtroom have been broadcast first on the 6 o'clock and then on the 10 o'clock news, where it was seen by roughly 500,000 people. And nobody realized that there was any problem with this until 10.45 the following morning when the court's clerk got in touch with the BBC to express some concern from the court that this material was being played on the BBC. The BBC immediately held their hands up and agreed that it was contempt and they ought to have uh, they ought to have picked up on it earlier. Uh, and at the subsequent hearing to decide on their penalty, uh, the uh, the court commented, it beggars belief that a team of very experienced BBC journalists, all but one of whom did not need to hear the warning at the start of proceedings, should have given no thought to the propriety of getting unauthorized personnel to record what was going on in court. Uh, I've highlighted one bit that just jumped out at me, uh, whereby it was noted, it is of very limited mitigation that all the journalists were operating in a world in which Zoom or similar remote platforms had become a new normality. Any competent journalist should know, without having to stop and think about it, that court proceedings are in a different category to proceedings in Parliament or other types of meeting which would have to be held remotely. I highlight that just because Although I can have some sympathy with that idea and certainly think, yes, there were senior journalists involved in this who ought to have known that something wasn't right, it needn't necessarily be taken for granted, in my view, that, again, ordinary members of the public, like Ms. Finch, who hadn't heard that warning, would take it for granted uh, that that was the case, particularly in a world where Zoom hearings had become the norm. And if this did manage to uh, befuddle journalists, including some very senior journalists and members of the public, then that, in my view, does raise some pretty substantial concerns about how clear the law is in this area. So, very briefly, in summing up, what lessons can we learn from this? Well, uh, the Victorian Law Reform Commission, that's Victoria as in um, a region in Australia rather than the mid to late 19th century, uh, have made a number of recommendations that are cited with approval by the Law Commission in their uh, brief report with which I started this lecture. And what they propose effectively is a new statutory framework, what would amount in our jurisdiction, I suppose, to a Contempt of Court Reform Act uh, to supplement or replace the Contempt of Court Act as it presently exists. And among their recommendations, which are cited with approval by the Law Commission, are that this new statutory framework would reflect the court's contempt powers, where they come from, that they're inherent powers to protect the administration of justice, uh, give definitions for how and when those powers are used, uh, how they are to operate, what procedures are to be in place, trying to avoid what happened in the case of Yaxley Lennon, where the trial judge embarked upon procedures that were then quashed subsequently by the Court of Appeal, define what the scope of the powers are at all levels. And also, I think this is probably useful from uh, a public relations point of view, introduce new categories of contempt that can more clearly spell out what kind of behavior is to be treated as contempt of court. Um, so rather than just having that broad general umbrella, you have something like what we currently have with the Fraud Act, where uh, uh, post-fraud act, we have a world in which we've got fraud by false representation, fraud by abuse of process, etc. You, in this case, have different flavors of contempt, contempt by conduct that interferes with court proceedings, by non-compliance with a court order, publishing prejudicial material, interference with or reprisals against those involved in court proceedings. That might be caught in this jurisdiction by the offense of witness interference, which is already on the statute books. But nevertheless, um, I think it is useful to bear in mind how having these new flavors of contempt offenses might give a little bit more clarity to the public. And also it's recommended just generally try and minimize situations in which you have, as happened to His Honor Judge Marston in the Yaxley Lennon case, a situation in which the judge has to also act as wit effectively the chief witness and the prosecutor in the same case, especially when there are differing accounts of events given, and that might not become apparent until after the matter has already been settled. So that is my very quick whistle-stop tour of the way in which contempt is developing. 
Um, it might seem to be something of a niche area, certainly, although we've all had to deal with obnoxious clients from time to time. Hopefully, we don't, you know, we warn them of any conduct that might stray into the area of contempt. But as I think some of these cases that we've discussed have shown, it is an area where there is more potential for mishap and for potential injustice than it might be obvious at first. And all of that, I think, presents a pretty excellent case for bearing some of those recommendations in mind as we think about where the law might develop from here. Thank you very much, everybody, uh, for your attention. And uh, yeah, I think that's everything that I have to say. Oh, thank you, Tim. Um, uh, just bear with me for a second and I will try and get my slides up in turn. Excuse me. Okay, good. Um, I apologise in advance for any further technological um, hiccups. Um, tonight, I just want to speak quite briefly about protest, willful obstruction of highways and lawful excuse. Um, as you undoubtedly know, uh, the laws around protest are changing or threatening um, to change at the moment. Uh, the policing bill currently going through the House of Lords uh, curtails peaceful process in a number of ways. Uh, but at the same time, and this is a subject of my talk, really, the recent Supreme Court uh, judgment, Ziegler, uh, in which demonstrators' convictions for obstructing the highway during a protest were overturned, um, has essentially, or perhaps at least anecdotally, um, affirmed the right to protest. Following that judgment, uh, indeed, the CPS have reportedly uh, reviewed its stance in relation to similar appeals. Um, and as I understand it, defendants are being acquitted in the magistrate's court on successful arguments that their actions in exercising their ECHR Articles 10 and 11 rights were proportionate and constituted a reasonable excuse, which is the statutory defence to a charge of obstructing the highway. Um, obstructing the highway, as you may know, is an offence under Section 137 of the Highways Act 1980. Um, and that um, section says that if a person without lawful authority or excuse in any way willfully obstructs the free passage along a highway, he is guilty of an offence. Um, and that offence attracts um, a level three fine. So it's just a summary only offence, but still. Um, it's one of several offences commonly levied at protesters. And for the next few minutes, I just want to take a closer look at the judgment in Ziegler and the factors that the Supreme Court identified as relevant to an assessment of whether um, someone exercising their Article 10 and 11 ECHR rights uh, constituted a reasonable excuse for obstructing a highway. And then I just want to briefly look at that judgment in context. Um, so whether um, it has any potential impact on the bill, perhaps, um, how it's changed the protest rights landscape. Um, basically, how does this judgment sit with the curtailments in the bill? Is this a glimmer of hope? Is it a matter of lock-on devices, which, as you may know, are essentially boxes with pipes sticking out the side, uh, you stick your arm in and it makes it harder for the police to disengage you um, if that's what they want to do. So the four appellants were um, charged with highway, highway obstruction using these devices to block an approach to the Excel Centre in Docklands, East London, when it hosted the um, Defence and Security Equipment International Arms Fair in 2017. Now, the appellants were acquitted initially of obstructing the highway um, in Stratford Magistrates Court in 2018. And the district judge who heard uh, the trial had regard to the appellants' uh, articles 10 and 11 ECHR rights. So that is, um, as, you, as you may know, right to freedom of expression and freedom of assembly. Um, and he concluded that the prosecution had not proved that their obstruction of the highway uh, which he found to be limited, targeted and peaceful, had been unreasonable. However, the DPP appealed uh, by way of state, uh, case stated to the Divisional Court and their acquittals were overturned by the Divisional Court, which considered that the district judge's assessment of the proportionality of the interference with the appellant's ECHR rights had been wrong. Um, 
uh, basically because he had failed to strike a fair balance between the interests of the appellant protesters and those of other members of the public, um, their right basically to pass freely along the highway. All four appellants were sentenced to 12 months conditional discharges subsequently. Following that judgment, uh, which was in 2019, I believe, the position in law was effectively that protests um, constituting a deliberate obstruction of the highway um, that caused anything more than a minimal impact on the rights of others was unlawful. Interference with Articles 10 and 11 rights in circumstances in which the obstruction was more than de minimis was proportionate. Uh, Ziegler and her fellow appellants appealed to the Supreme Court successfully. So in a majority judgment handed down on the 25th of June this year, um, the Supreme Court, oh, I should say, w w the case was essentially concerned with two matters. Uh, one was the test to be applied by an appellate court to an assessment of the trial court in respect of a statutory defence of lawful excuse when convention rights are engaged in a criminal matter. And secondly, and this is the issue that I'm most um, interested in this evening, is deliberate physically obstructive conduct capable of constituting a lawful excuse for the purposes of Section 137 of the um, Highways Act, where the impact of the deliberate obstruction on other highway users is more than de minimis or minimal and prevents them or is capable of preventing them from passing along the highway. So the question was basically, um, is deliberately obstructive conduct capable of um, con constituting excuse for the purposes of section 137? And the answer that the Supreme Court arrived at is that um, protests that are deliberately obstructive are not per se um, unlawful, even when the impact on others is more than de minimis. So the Supreme Court said that it was clear from Strasbourg jurisprudence <laughs> prudence, sorry, um, that intentional disruption or obstruction going beyond that which was de minimis did not automatically justify interference with protesters' Articles 10 and 11 rights. Rather, uh, there must be an assessment of the facts in each um, individual case to determine whether the interference was necessary in a democratic society uh, for the purposes of Articles 10, subsection 2 and 11, subsection 2. The Supreme Court set out a non-exhausted list of relevant factors taken from case law, both Strasbourg um, and domestic case law, noting that the examination of factors must be open textured without according those factors any reordained weight. Uh, so not by any means the first time that factors relevant to this sort of um, assessment have been identified by courts, but this case sets out factors following a review of all the relevant case law. So the factors that the Supreme Court identified um, were firstly, the extent to which the continuation of the, pro uh, the protest would breach domestic law, the duration of the protest, the degree to which the protesters occupied the land, the extent of the actual interference caused to the rights of others, um, and that's including property rights of the owners of the land and the rights of members of the public. Uh, secondly, the nature of the place where the obstruction occurred, and they um, drew a, a difference between residential and commercial areas. Uh, thirdly, whether the obstruction was targeted at the object of protest. And then the importance of the precise location of the protesters and their right to choose a location and the place, time and modalities of assembly. And lastly, um, prior notification and cooperation with the police, especially if the protest was likely to be contentious or pro provoke disorder, but that was subject to any domestic requirement of uh, for prior notification, not encroaching on the essence of the rights. Following that judgment, um, the CPS 
dropped its opposition to activist appeals that were in the pipe work at the time um, against their convictions for obstructing roads in various different demonstrations. And uh, as I said before, I understand that people are being acquitted in the magistrate's court having successfully argued that they had a reasonable excuse in exercising their right of uh, protest. And if you go on the Extinction Rebellion website, for example, there are a number of um, re reports of that happening, including um, by people who represented themselves in the magistrate's court. The judgment is being hailed as crucial by activists, clarifying as it does the right to protest and changing um, how direct action protesting should be policed, or at least uh, that is the hope. Just to look at the judgment in, the, in, the, in its wider context, <clears throat> it comes at a time when the right to protest risks curtailment in the form of COVID related restrictions. For example, if you recall the High Court ruling in relation to the planned Sarah Everard uh, vigil in March this year, the High Court ruled that tier four regulations do not allow police to um, prevent people exercising their articles 10 and 11 rights unless necessary and proportionate and putting the ball in the Metropolitan Police's court to explore with the organisers of the vigil the feasibility of a COVID safe gathering. However, um, the Met refused to engage and then responded in what um, appeared to be a deplorably heavy handed way. We've also seen attempts to limit the right to protest in the form of the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill. You're probably very familiar with it by now. It touches on a broad range of subjects of interest to criminal practitioners. And if you attended the um, last J6 uh, webinar in May, you'll have heard Francesca Kirby discussing the changes to pre-charge bail contained in the bill. And I think she actually um, touched on the curtailments to the right to process in the bill as well. Um, so by way of a, a brief recap, perhaps, um, in relation to protest clauses in the bill, confer on the Home Secretary and the police what critics have said are unacceptably wide and vague powers to curb demonstrations. Um, the Joint Committee on Human Rights, for example, has highlighted clauses which allow restrictions to be imposed on protests because of the level of noise that they generate uh, and increase penalties on demonstrators who breach conditions placed on protests. And the JCHR have called for these to be scrapped. The bill is, um, by its own admission, designed to allow the police to take a more proactive approach in managing highly disruptive protests causing um, what's termed serious disruption to the public. The JCHR and others have characterised as unacceptable clauses allowing the Home Secretary to define what constitutes serious disruption, a definition that the police can then rely on to curb protests. In fact, the, the Joint Committee on Human Rights has urged the Home Office to make that as yet unclear definition clear now, so that it could be considered whilst the bill is still being scrutinised. Um, and they added that if no need for particular clarification has yet been identified, then we struggle to see how the powers contained in the bill can be considered necessary. Now, we may have some insight already into Home Secretary Priti Patel's opinion of what counts as serious disruption. If you um, recall in September last year, she called um, Extinction Rebellion activists so-called eco-crusaders turned criminals and an emerging threat whose campaign of civil disobedience was a shameful attack on our way of life, our economy, and the livelihoods of the hardworking majority. She was also heard um, using the phrase anarchy on our streets and um, opining that the very criminals who disrupt our free society must be stopped and together we must all stand firm against the guerrilla tactics of Extinction Rebellion. And then earlier this year, um, she pronounced on uh, Black Lives Matter protests and protesters. The protests were uh, dreadful, in her opinion, and she disagreed with the gesture of uh, taking the knee. And in fact, she said at that time, I don't support protest, although did clarify shortly afterwards that she meant 
the BLM protests specifically. Um, I just want to quickly look at the new statutory offence of public nuisance contained in the bill. Um, the JCHR in June warned that any interference with non-violent protest places demonstrators Article 10 and 11 uh, rights at risk. And there is in the bill this new um, public nuisance offence, despite the fact that there are already statutory laws dealing with public nuisance uh, type incidents, including the offence of obstructing the highway. The bill uh, simultaneously abolishes the common law offence. So there is, a, there is a, at the moment a common law offence of public nuisance and replaces it with a wider statutory offence of intentionally or recklessly causing serious harm or risk of serious harm to the public or obstructing the public in the exercise or enjoyment of a right. Now, what has attracted particular criticism is the fact that serious harm includes serious annoyance and serious inconvenience. So in a way, it's an incredibly broad offence constituting um, a serious risk for protest rights. And as has been repeatedly pointed out in the context of criticising this bill, protests are by their very nature often noisy and inconvenient. Oh, sorry, my phone is ringing. Um, in fact, Lord Justice Laws, and I think I've got this on the next slide. I, I lifted this from the Liberty briefing on the bill, forgive me, Liberty. Um, but this really encapsulates um, the criticisms I think that have been made. And in the case of Tabernacle against uh, Secretary of State for Defence in 2009, uh, Lord Justice Law said that rights worth having are unruly things. Demonstrations and protests are liable to be a nuisance. They are likely to be inconvenient and tiresome, at least perceived as such uh, by others who are out of sympathy with them. And I, I think the thing is that public nuisance was really at the point of not really arising in the context of policing protests. Um, we have other offences which have since taken its place, for example, Communications Act offences, criminal damage, public order offences, and of course the, the offence of obstructing the highway. So the, the question I wanted to ask is, does the Supreme Court's ruling in Ziegler assist with any of this? Well, there is a, a danger that this new offence, if it comes into force, um, could be used to criminalise people engaged in previously lawful protests because of its broad reach. And um, included in that now would be those who deliberately obstruct the highway in the exercise of their Articles 10 and 11 rights. That said, there remains in the um, draft statutory offence the defence of reasonable excuse. And we now have a precedent for the premise that this can, doesn't necessarily, but can include exercising one's Article 10 and 11 rights in a proportionate way, even where the obstruction is more than minimal. And that's a, a departure from the previously understood position. Now, Liberty and others have um, previously argued that it's that it's not clear on the face of the bill the extent to which the exercise of fundamental rights would constitute a reasonable excuse. Um, so perhaps now we have some guidance from the Supreme Court, at least. Um, the Joint Committee on the Human Rights have raised the objection that the term, uh, the term reasonable excuse, is subjective and would give significant discretion to the police to decide when peaceful and otherwise lawful protests would amount to public nuisance. Again, um, can we point to Ziegler now as authority that exercising um, the right to protest can constitute a reasonable excuse? Now, that said, um, the judgment doesn't appear to have had much immediate impact on the way in which protests are police. Um, as Extinction Rebellion and others uh, had hoped. As the press put it at the time, the Met Police, this is back in August um, when Extinction Rebellion announced a new campaign of um, protests. The Met Police uh, have vowed to tackle willful obstruction in spite of the Ziegler judgment. Um, Matt Twist, uh, the Deputy Assistant Commissioner of the Met, told a press briefing at the time 
we do not need to take in uh, forgive <laughs> we do need to take into account Ziegler but it isn't a significant change in the law it, he went on to say if there's a willful obstruction which is unreasonable and it's extended in impact then of course I think there'll be an expectation that police take action and in fact um without really knowing anything about the, the circumstances you may have noticed on the 15th of September and, and the 13th so across those two days I think it was 92 and then 70 activists from an organization called Insulate Britain were arrested after they blocked traffic on the M25 during the morning rush hour and I believe yesterday or perhaps the day before the High Court granted an injunction against those protesters but there is no um question in my view that the this Supreme Court ruling comes at a highly opportune moment in the context of what I don't think it's hyperbole to call a wholesale attack on the right to protest encapsulated in the policing bill. The case is clearly not going to mark a sea change in the way that protests are policed and obviously it's not a, a, a sort of carte blanche um, to obstruct highways in certain contexts. Um, but as, as to whether the police have downplayed or even effectively ignored it or not, perhaps remains to be seen. But what the judgment does give us is a, a clear set of factors we can use to argue for a finding of reasonable excuse in the exercise of clients' ECHR rights. Um, thank you. That's the end of my talk. Uh, how do I do this? Okay, I think that, yep, I don't think we've got any questions, so um, <laughs> that's a relief. Um, I can only assume that that means all questions were satisfactorily answered in both really. talks, uh, yes. in which case, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Cheers. Okay, um, thank you very much, and uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. See you the next one. Cheers. <laughs>